good morning. It is a, a great privilege to be with you this morning. I want to say thank you to the administration for the invitation to come and to preach. Uh, one of the things I love so much about Southern Seminary is their commitment to the local church. And I've experienced that in many, many ways personally in my own training uh, here at Southern. Uh, we continue to experience that. Clifton is uh, just a mile down the road from here. And our, our, our sense of partnership with this institution and in, in seeking to train uh, future ministers of the gospel is, uh, is a profound, uh, deep partnership that we feel. And as Matt said, uh, we have personally experienced that commitment to the local church through the hospitality of Southern in, in a particular time of need uh, for our church. So uh, just so thankful for Southern and so thankful to be here uh, with you this morning. The Bible says that if you want to pursue present faithfulness to God, then you must cultivate a trust and a confidence and an appreciation for your future inheritance as a Christian. So if you want to be of earthly good, then you must be heavenly minded. We see this in, in multiple places in the scriptures, Hebrews 11, 1 Peter 1, Colossians 3. And as your eternal inheritance as a Christian grows to be more valued and more sure, in your own heart and mind, God will use that to sustain your faith and sustain your obedience through all kinds of temporary trials and suffering in this life. So my goal in, in preaching God's word to you this morning is simple. I want the promise of your personal, glorious, bodily resurrection from the dead in which you will share the very image of the resurrected Christ to grow more valued and more sure in your own heart and mind as a means of God sustaining you in faith and obedience today. I think that was precisely Paul's goal when he wrote 1 Corinthians 15, verses 35 to 49, and that's the text that I wanna consider you with you this morning. So if you would turn there in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I will read beginning at verse 35. But someone, someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body, body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there's one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind and the glory of the earthly is of another. There's one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. 
just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Let's pray. Father, I pray now that by your spirit you would be at work in our hearts and minds to grow in our confidence and our appreciation for our future inheritance that you have provided to us in Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name. Amen. The resurrection from the dead is one of the most contested and one of the most essential truths of the Christian faith. Paul has said just a few verses earlier in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. And those who have fallen asleep, those who have died in Christ, have truly perished. If there is no resurrection from the dead, then sin and death really do get the last word. This life really is as hard and hopeless as it can seem to be at times. And ultimately, there's nothing more to say. But in fact, Paul says, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So the reality of Christ's resurrection guarantees the reality of those who are in Christ by faith. And as you know, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul appeals to the eyewitness testimony of many who actually saw the risen Christ to affirm the reality of his resurrection. And yet, some of those in Corinth, like many people today, maybe like you this morning, they were struggling to believe this truth. They couldn't comprehend, comprehend how people with physical bodies could possibly rise to new life. I think that's in part because they knew what we know. They know, they knew what, what happens to the body when we die, it decays, it deteriorates, it returns to dust. And no matter how hard people try to stop that reality and, and preserve the condition of the body after death, it can't be done. And, and you know, people have gone to great lengths to try to do this. So you think of the, the mummies from Egypt thousands of years ago in this effort to preserve the body for the afterlife. That happens right up to the present day with companies like Alcor in Scottsdale, Arizona. I wasn't familiar with this company until recently, but for only $200,000, they will freeze your dead body in liquid nitrogen with the hope that someday technology will be invented which will be able to revive your body from the dead. I'll let you decide if that's a good deal or not. But the reality is even these extreme measures that people have gone to cannot keep the body from the decay and the destruction that death brings upon us. So, can dead bodies really be raised to life? And even if they could, is that something we would really want? It might bring to mind movies that you shouldn't have watched as a kid and now wish you never had. It's hard for us to imagine the resurrection of the dead. On top of this, common Greek and pagan perspective in this time when Paul was writing, I think it's a common perspective today, was that the physical body was inferior to the non-physical spirit. Like material, physical things of which, of course, the human body is one, really were considered to be inherently inferior to that which was not material. So, so surely if there was going to be a future glorious life beyond death, then surely the physical body would not be a part of it. I mean, if anything, death, death might free us from this physical existence. So, as the Apostle Paul affirms the reality of Christ's resurrection and, and by implication, the reality of all who are of the resurrection of all who are saved in Christ, 
He raises these objections in, in verse 35 that apparently he had heard from the, Corinthian, the, the Corinthians themselves. How are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Paul, we have no compartment, we have no box, we have no room in our thinking to, to understand how we could be physically raised from the dead. We, we don't understand what you're talking about. And what is Paul's response in verse 36? Essentially, he says, yes, you do. Now, that's my gentler, more tactful way of summarizing what Paul said. Paul said, you fool. But I think what he's saying is, no, no, you do have a category for this in your thinking. And then where does Paul go? It might not be where you would expect Paul to go as he defends the reality of the resurrection, but what he says is, consider creation. That's where he takes us. If you consider the world around you, you will actually see ways in which the resurrection of the body fits with God's design of the world. There, there are examples or analogies that are already within creation that point us to the real possibility and hope of resurrection. And Paul points us then to three things in particular. The first thing Paul points to is this. Life can emerge from death. Life can come out of death. Now, it's also true we also see that life moves toward and ends in death. Paul's, Paul's not denying that point. And in fact, that may be the, mo the more common thing that we see and experience in the world, especially as it relates to human life in this present age. But that's not all we see. We also see that life can actually come out of death. And the example that Paul gives from creation is the, the sowing or the planting of seeds. It's Paul's opening statement in verse 36. You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. The sowing or the planting of seeds, it, it doesn't signify the end of life for that seed. In fact, it's the beginning of life to come. And, and it's a particularly fitting example because typically a seed must be buried in the ground in order for that new life to come out of it. If you just take seeds and you just sprinkle them on your kitchen counter, you throw them out on your driveway, driveway nothing's gonna happen. They're just gonna stay those dry and lifeless seed. But, but when you bury them in the ground, it's only then that new life rises up from those seeds. I, I grew up in a small town in Western Illinois uh, I grew up in town, but it wasn't far to get to the, to the outskirts of town. And, and in every direction from our town, there were miles and miles of cornfields and soybean fields. So I grew up just seeing this annual cycle of, of the fields being planted. And, and you know, the, the, the farmers, they would put out these, these long, beautiful rows. They put thousands of seeds in the ground and when they would do that, those farmers and the people of the town who, who depended on their food, uh, we didn't gather and have a mass mourning for those seeds. Now those, those seeds went in the ground with the hope and I would say even the confident expectation that in a matter of months, those fields would be filled with these vibrant green plants and, and the, pro, the produce that would grow on them. We, we could multiply examples of that, right, from the agricultural world, grass and trees and bushes and flowers and fruit and vegetables, which only come to life after their seeds are buried in the ground and, and there's the end of the existence of that seed as a seed. But then new life comes out of it. And so Paul says, in a sense, hey, you shouldn't be surprised by this. You see it around you all the time. Life can emerge from death. But, but Paul goes on, he says more. Not only can life emerge from death, we also see a greater body can emerge from a lesser body. This is the second point Paul makes in verse 37 as he 
observes the world. And, and again, the world of agriculture in particularly. It's not simply that a seed is buried in the ground and then rises to new life in the same form. It actually rises to new, to new life with, with a body, with a physical form that's dramatically different and get this, dramatically greater than the way in which that seed was buried in the ground. Verse 37, and what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. When you compare a seed to the plant or the tree or the flower that grows from that seed, there's just no way that you can predict what that plant will look like when it rises to new life. The plant is so different and it's so much greater that you never could have guessed that it would come from that bare kernel that was planted in the ground. Paul uses the example of wheat or grain. If, if you had never seen a mature wheat plant before and then you planted the, the field with seeds, how amazed would you be when you see those fields just shining with gold as they wave in the wind? I think unfortunately for, for most of us city dwellers, we're, we're sort of removed from the regular observation and reminder of these things. Maybe you've even tried to plant something in a pot in your house and nothing came up. We, we did a school project recently with my second grader where we uh, had to grow flowers in a styrofoam cup. And I would say, what came up was less than glorious, okay? <laughs> but, but even then, the, the, even those little seedlings, they were very different from what was planted. And, and so this is something you, you can understand the point that Paul's making. I, I was thinking of, personally, I was thinking of rose bushes. Have you ever seen rose seeds? They are these tiny little woodish brown, very drab seeds. If you found a pile of them on your deck, you'd probably sweep them off as debris, thinking there's nothing significant here. But can you imagine and think about what comes out of a, a rose seed? The brilliant colors, the intricate shape and the interlocking of the petals of that flower, the rigid stalk and the sharpness of the thorns and the indescribable fragrance that comes from the mature flower. What you plant is not at all the body that comes to be. And this reality is being displayed all the time in the world around us. And when it comes to seeds, not only do we see new life emerging from the death of the seed, but the life that emerges does so with a body and a physical form that is so much greater, so much more complex, so much more substantial, so much more beautiful and glorious than the body that was planted. Life can emerge from death and a greater body can emerge from a lesser body. Here's Paul's third observation from the world around us. God gives a variety of bodies as he chooses. God gives a variety of bodies as he chooses. So here, Paul moves beyond just the agricultural world and he really calls us to consider all of creation. He calls us to consider the astounding variety and diversity of form that is displayed in the physical creation. Look at what Paul says again in verse 38. <clears throat> but God gives it a body as he has chosen and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there's one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, the glory of the earthly is of another. There's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So basically, Paul says, if it is true that according to God's sovereign power and design, there are such a diversity of bodies, such a variety of, of physical creatures and of physical forms, and each one of them 
possesses their own distinct glory and beauty and complexity according to God's sovereign power, according to his sovereign choice, which is so fitting for their particular environment, their particular purpose. If if that's all true, then what makes you think that God would be limited from raising people from the dead with bodies that will possess and display the glory of his choosing and which are perfectly fitted for the resurrection life. I mean, think about, again, creation. How amazing is it that fish can breathe in water, if that's even the right way to say it. I'm not sure if that's the right way to say it, but it's amazing when you think about it, that birds can just soar effortlessly through the air, that a cheetah can run over 70 miles an hour, not to mention the incredible variety of abilities and complexity and beauty of fish from fish, of bird from bird, of animal from animal. There there just isn't time to even consider the endless variety and glory. Or who can fully appreciate the glory of the sun? If it were a hollow ball, it could hold over a million planet Earths. It's a cool 10,000 degrees on the surface and an estimated 27 million degrees at its core. Day by day, we receive our heat and our light from the sun from 93 million miles away. And yet our sun is just a very average sized star among what are literally a countless number of stars in the known universe. Every star differing from star in glory. And then consider the glory of the human body among all the bodies of creation, even in this fallen age, to live and to breathe and to move, to run and to jump and to throw and to create and to design and to build and to paint and to draw and to sculpt and to talk and to sing and to smile and to laugh, to feel warmth and cold and pleasure and pain. The glory of the human body and how endless the variety and distinctions among the nearly eight billion people upon the earth today, not to mention all of the people of all of human history. So, if your hope for the resurrection of the body is in the owners of Alcor Incorporated, who for $200,000 of your hard-earned money will freeze your lifeless body with the hope that one day some human technology will be invented that will raise you from the dead, I think you should feel a little dubious about the resurrection. But if your hope is in the one true and living God who by his sovereign power and wisdom created everything out of nothing by his word and gives to every fish and bird and animal and star and planet and person the precise physical form and glory that he chooses, then you shouldn't be surprised that this same God can give to you personally a glorious physical resurrection body of his choosing that is perfectly fitted for eternal life and glory in his own presence. Be confident if your hope is in Christ of the resurrection from the dead. Consider creation, what do you see? You see that life can emerge from death. You see that a greater body can emerge from a lesser body. You see that God gives all variety of bodies as he chooses. Verse 42, so is it with the resurrection of the dead. You know, there's a real glory to our 
present earthly bodies. And yet, living in this present world and in this fallen evil age, we're subject to the realities of God's judgment because of sin. We see and experience the weight and the pain and the futility and the grief of that reality in our bodies, right? We feel it in our physical bodies. We are subject to dishonor in our bodies. That's because of the way we sin sometimes with our bodies. Sometimes that's because of the way we are sinned against. We experience dishonor in our bodies. This is a reality simply because we live in a fallen world and as we make our way towards death, we experience the indignity that comes with the failing of our bodies. But just as a seed is buried in the ground and rises to a form of new life that could never have been imagined, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. Listen to this. What is sown perishable is raised imperishable. Not just life out of death, but eternal life out of death. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. All of the indignities and dishonor that we experience in this life, in our bodies, we will be raised with the glory that far surpasses any glory that we could imagine in this life. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. By the sovereign power of God himself, we will be raised in power. Paul says in verse 44, it is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Now now the language in that contrast, it, it might not seem immediately clear to us. I mean, after Paul spends so much time arguing for the physical resurrection from the dead, does he all of a sudden take that away and say, hey, we're only going to be spirits in the resurrection? That's not what he says. He doesn't say we will be raised as spirits. He says our bodies will be raised to be a spiritual body. So the contrast here is not between physical and non-physical. It's between the natural and the spiritual. And I think we get some help here from earlier in Paul's letter, early in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul uses these very same terms to distinguish the spiritual person from the natural person. And, And there the terms are describing the basic difference between a Christian and a non Christian, a believer and an unbeliever, a spiritual person is someone who has been enlightened by the Spirit of God that dwells within them to understand and receive God's truth. Whereas the natural person who has not received the Spirit of God rejects that truth. So spiritual here refers not to the non-physical body but to a body that's characterized by what? The presence and power and transforming work of the Holy Spirit. Commentator Gordon Fee says this, the transformed body is not composed of spirit, it is a body adapted to the eschatological existence that is under the ultimate domination of the spirit. Listen to this, it's a body fitted for the new age, the new age of the spirit. Therefore, To use Paul's language again in verse 36, don't be foolish in your thinking. Don't deny the possibility of the resurrection when God has given such clear pointers in this present world and such clear instruction in his revealed word. By God's wisdom and power and glory, the resurrection, it's not just a possibility, it's a certainty. Let your Let your appreciation and certainty grow in your heart and mind. So here then is the final consideration in our text this morning. Where does Jesus come into all of this? This could really warrant a whole nother sermon, but I'm not going to preach a whole nother sermon. 
But consider this. Whereas the first man, Adam, representing all of humanity, failed to obey God and brought sin and death upon the entire human race, Jesus, the last Adam, has succeeded where that first Adam failed. And as the representative before God of everyone who puts their faith and trust in Him as Lord and Savior by His own perfect obedience and righteousness, Jesus has won the title, the right to everlasting resurrection life. And he now shares that freely with sinners who put their trust and hope in him as the second Adam who has won eternal life for us. And, and, and Jesus guarantees this by giving us now the Holy Spirit. He gives the Spirit as a gift that we receive now as Christians and and, and transform our life in so many ways now, but, but more wonderfully guarantees that the presence of the Spirit guarantees that one day we too will bear Christ's own image as the resurrected man from heaven. That's what the gift of the Spirit guarantees for you today. Jesus said to his disciples, John chapter 12, verses 24 and 25, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Jesus, the man from heaven, has died and risen from the dead that he might bear much fruit. And if your trust and your hope is in him as Lord and Savior, you will be that fruit and you will bear his image. I pray that hope will encourage you to keep trusting and obeying the Lord until that day. Let's pray. Lord, again, how we thank you for this great hope that has been given to us that one day as those who are united with you by faith, we too will share in the resurrection life in great glory and joy forever. Please sustain us by your spirit and by your word as we wait patiently and trust and obey you until we experience the fulfillment of that hope. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.